you all like I said for joining and giving up your Friday morning we hopefully will have this done within the hour but it's just a really nice chance for us to be able to speak to you before we start working with your foster children and providing tuition I want to share a bit about the plan for the for the tuition and then also I'm going to hand over to Rachel who's going to talk to you about some of the types of lessons and types of education that our tutors will be doing with your foster children if you've got questions at any point feel free to raise your hand or if you type them into the chat box then one of us will be able to reply straight away and then we'll make sure there's time for more questions at the end as well so um the cycle metacognition and learning will become clearer as we go the first thing that i'm going to do though is just talk to you a bit more generally about what we're hoping to do and who we are and how we're going to be supporting your foster children so I'm not sure how much information has been shared about targeted provision with you um, from Hertfordshire Virtual School, but I thought I would start with just a very quick summary of, of who we are and what we do. We are a specialist tutoring and mentoring provider. So we work with virtual schools and schools and local authority teams nationally to support young people to reach their potential. So we're often working with young people who might be struggling to access mainstream education or who might need a bit of one-to-one -one support as well to do the best that they can or we're providing sort of targeted support before GCSEs or before exams to make sure that our pupils have the support they need before a sort of trickier time in their educational journey. We work with about 2,000 people, 2,000 young people a year that sort of grows every year and changes every year depending on the different schools and local authorities that we're working with and we prioritise planning sessions that meet our young people's individual needs so we'll find out a bit about them before we give them a tutor find out a bit about what they need and then we'll try and do that so that they've got a really good chance of making progress in their learning um can you go to the next slide rage thank you so some of you might have already heard from the tutor that will be working with your foster child if you haven't then that will happen in the next few days what I thought would be useful is just to give you a quick summary of each of the tutors that will be working with us on this project so that you'll know a bit about the tutor who is working with your foster child when they reach out to you. So some of the young people we are supporting are doing maths, two math tutors, Melanie and Gary. Melanie has been a vice principal and a designated teacher. She's got lots of experience in leadership within education. And then she's also been a one-to-one -one tutor and a trainer for other teachers. So she's coming with lots of experience, which is really, really great. Gary, um, he's actually one of the first tutors we worked with at Targeted Provision and he is our head of recruitment's old English teacher, which is really lovely. So we know a lot about Gary and we know that he's been brilliant with the young people that he's supported. He's very creative, so really great if, if a child's struggling to engage or doesn't really enjoy learning. He's quite fun and makes it, makes it enjoyable. And then English, Joanne and we've got Bill. Both of them have done a lot of work specifically online tutoring and they sort of make it very interactive and fun again. Uh, Joanne's been a SENCO, so she's got lots of experience working with children who struggle more generally to access learning. Uh, she's also used ICT a lot to, to make it sort of, like I said, really interactive. And then Bill is an English and foreign languages teacher. He's also got sort of over 20 years experience working as a tutor and a teacher. And the metacognition side of things is where Bill is really excited. So he'll be able to do a lot of great development of skills with the young people that he's supporting. The plan, and I've explained this to hopefully most of you on the phone, but for anybody who I haven't spoken to or for anybody who just needs a reminder, each of your foster children will receive an hour a week of one-to-one -one teaching online, either in maths or English. You will know that um, by my emails, but I'm happy to remind anybody. Tutor will send you as the foster carer the login information to the online lesson. They can also send it to your child's school email address, but they can't use your child's personal email address just for safeguarding reasons. So if there's any problems with that, again, just let us know or ask me any questions that you need to. In addition to the one-to-one -one session that they'll have once a week, and this is where the project's really exciting, they will also have a group session where they'll work with a few other pupils who are also part of this project. Probably on a Saturday morning or a Saturday afternoon, just because that seems to be the time that all of the young people are free. But the tutor will be able to agree that with the young people and with you as well, so that you're in control of when that session will be. The point of that session is that all of the children will be developing skills for exams and skills for learning and the group session should be a really nice time for them to practice together and to see how other people are learning from their tutors what's nice is that because they'll all have the same tutor it won't be new or, or daunting for any of them they'll be working with an adult that they already know from their one-to-one -one sessions 
tutors will give us some feedback once a week on how things are going and they'll also give that feedback to the virtual school so that will be included in your children children's peps and in meetings and in conversations going forward and we can also make sure schools are kept up to date with how they're doing as well and we're also going to offer the young people a chance to gain an AQA qualification which is just a certificate which will show that they've developed some of these study skills and that will be something that their tutor will do with them and your role really is that by sort of understanding what we're doing and the goals of the project we're hoping that you'll be able to ask your foster child how it's going to be able to engage a bit with the resources that they're using and really just to sort of understand and to be able to ask us questions throughout if you want to get more information about how things are going and I think that is the introduction really to the project so what I'll do now is I'll hand over to Rachel who is one of our SEN specialists she works very very closely with our tutors to develop resources and to support our young people and she's put together some information and some training for you guys on, on what metacognition means and why it's important to, to young people as they go into their GCSE year. So I'll hand over to Rach. Thank you, Sophie. Okay, what is metacognition? I'm not going to make this a, a science-y a lesson or anything. Um, I want us to have a bit of fun just to understand um, how we learn and therefore be able to help our young people and understand how they will learn as well. Uh, because we often talk about helping our young people succeed and get good grades. Um, it's a lot more than just getting good grades. Uh, metaco metacognition, I always get it tongue tied with that. <laughs> um, it's all about their mindset and developing their character. And it, it's absolutely essential for them de to develop that purposeful disposition so that they can go out into the world and continue learning. Learning isn't something that stops at school, which is what we've sort of been trained into thinking. We go to school to learn and then we go out into the world to work. It doesn't work like that and successful, confident, empathetic citizens are those that are constantly learning. So what we're going to do, we're going to do some various activities together. Um, to help you see how you can change your young person's learning mindset, um, give them a really good start in life. So many of these activities um, are going to involve you thinking about your own learning so that you can bring the techniques back to your children. Um, now, I'm not going to embarrass you by making you say anything or have to answer questions. This is all you thinking about it. So I'm gonna set the activities. So if you, if you can have a pen and a piece of paper, this is one of the reasons we gave you the handout so that you can scribble all over it. Um, then you can think about the answers to some of these questions um, and maybe go away and think a bit further about it um, and how you learn and maybe the errors in your learning. We, we've all been taught there's a certain way to learn. Maybe you'll see after today, there are different ways to think about learning. Um, and if you can think about your own learning situation, then you can give that to your young people. Um, children that are taught these skills that we're going, I'm going to talk about today, they become less impulsive there's research to show that they display less opposition to their teachers and their parents. You often see young people who are really uptight with their teachers and their parents. And part of it is to do with their, um, the way they think about their learning and how restricted they feel and frustrated. So let's look at metacognition. It's commonly referred to as learning to learn. And it's where students develop an understanding of their own learning processes. And it's the ability to know yourself and to self-evaluate. So the opinions we form of ourselves help us progress. But sometimes, you see, they can lock us into a circle of failure. I can't do. I don't know how to. I've never been able to. That sort of thing. Um, now, there was some research that found that developing metacognition and self-regulation with students can have a huge impact on their overall progress. So we're going to take a, a moment, just a moment. Uh, so if you've got your piece of paper and pen, I want to th you to think about what you're good at, what you're bad at, who or what has made you form these opinions. 
So I'm just gonna give you a couple of minutes to just scribble down what you're good at, what you think you're bad at, and why you've got that opinion. Often when I do one of these uh, sort of questionnaires and I, I do it for myself and it's, you know, you're looking at what you're good at, what you're bad at. The bad list always gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The good list tends to be quite small, but you can always think of the bad things. Now, um, it's interesting as well to look at, look back and why do you think you're bad at a particular subject or maybe a, I can't run. What's, what's made you feel that? Um, it's an interesting thing to think. Okay. We're gonna come back to that idea a little bit later on and um, what's formed your opinions. But if we go back to children when they are first born, um, children are, natural experts at solving problems. Um, they did it through play, they develop, don't they? They watch, they learn, they copy and they practice. So as a species, we're natural problem solvers and we follow our instincts to work out what to do next. Um, most children, they'll get up and walk. They watch, they practice, they keep practicing until they get up and walk. They don't give up. But what gets in our way of this innate inability where to get, and we get stuck in our thinking, we can't develop anymore. We start to compare our performance with others. Uh, we might go into class and think, oh, I'm not as good as so-and-so at maths and therefore I must be bad at maths. Um, and we start judging ourselves against other people. We don't do that as tiny little children. We're not judging against other people. So we just go for it. But we tend to start losing that as we get older. So what we need to do is we need to start by helping our young people become curious, first of all, about their brain and the amazing power that actually it has. Um, they probably don't realize. Now I've got a really, really quick quiz there. Um, I'll, I'll read it through and I want you to think, are they true or false? If you printed out this PowerPoint, you can just put your T or your F next to it. But here are some facts and I want to think about, are they true or false? So an adult brain has about 100 billion neurons. Well, that's brain cells. Number two, signals in your neurons can travel at the same speed as a Formula One car, 225 miles per hour. Number three, your neurons create and send more messages than all the phones in the entire world. Number four, you learn by making connections between neurons. Number five, exercise can help you learn. Number six, an adult brain weighs about 1.3 kilograms. Number seven, your brain uses up 20% of your energy. Number eight, learning makes your brain more powerful. Number nine, your brain is more complex and powerful than any computer ever built. And number 10, your brain still works when you're asleep. You might want to just put in the chat bar, how many of those do you think were true? Let's throw a number in if you like. How many were true? Patsy's put in all of them. Yeah, brilliant, Patsy. Yeah, it is. In fact, every single one of those is true. Absolutely amazing what your brain can do and really what, what little we use of it sometimes. Um, and if we think about a, a, a bee, you've got a bee, he has 900, or it might be she, 900 brain cells um, and a brain the size of a grain of salt. 
So we've got 100 billion brain cells. A bee has 900 brain cells. Now think about that bee and what that bee can do to survive and all the different things that bee does to survive and has an amazing life cycle. And we have got billion, billion more uh, brain cells. It, it's an amazing thing. So just think about how big your brain and how powerful it is. And we can give that, that sort of insight into our young people. You know, they have a powerful machine there, far more powerful than their mobile phone that's in their hand or their laptop. Um, and they need to start being able to use it. So if we can understand how this brain works, we can increase our ability to self-regulate and we can become a very effective learner and we can develop cognitive flexibility. So there's three parts, three basic parts to the brain. So this is what research has shown. We've got a primitive brain. Um, it's also known as the reptilian brain. And that monitors our personal survival. Um, and you may have heard about the, probably in other training, you've heard about the fight or flight instinct, um, where that's our instinct to get up and either run from a situation or to fight back in a situation. That's our primitive brain coming into that. Then we've got the emotional brain. Um, that's located in the center of the brain and that's responsible for your memory and your emotion and your values. And then the third part is the neocortex or the thinking brain. I've, I've given you the sort of basic names here because, you know, I'm not a scientist, so we're not going, we're not having a biology lesson. Um, this is just the thinking part of the brain. It's your thinking cap um, and helps your higher thinking skills. Now, what I'm going to get you to do um, is make a brain. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to do it with our hands. OK, we bring our hands together and we join them together and then make your thumbs face you. OK, so your thumbs are pointing towards your chest. Now, your thumbs are the reptilian brain cell. So that's where the signals come through to your primitive brain. Now, if you then open those up, open your thumbs up, you can see your fingers and wiggle your fingers. OK. That's your emotional part of the brain. And then the knuckles on the top, they represent the thinking cap. And that's where all the hard work takes place. Now, all three, as you can see, they're all linked. They're not separate parts. And we need all of them for learning to take place. So let's have a look at this example. And we're going to see how the reptilian um, brain works. This is our primitive bit. So here's your example. Harry was on lesson report. So he was trying hard to concentrate in his maths lesson. The teacher bent down to pick something up from the floor. And as she stood up, a ruler went flying past her head. Harry looked up from his work and as everyone giggled and the teacher immediately accused him of throwing it. He went reptilian. He shouted back at her, slammed his fist on the desk and got sent to the head teacher. We can all imagine that scenario. OK, let's think about how Andy could have controlled his reptilian brain. What alternative action could he have taken there? Um, it, it's, it's an instinct that we do that, but we can learn to control that. Now, in an adult, road rage is a big example when adults go into this uh, primitive brain state. Um, we've all seen it, haven't we? And, and as some of us might suffer from it a bit. You know, somebody cuts you up and it's like, and you start on, on your horn, etc. So there's lots of examples, lots of situations where we go into this. Um, and I see it every day on social media. Um, it's somewhere where people go into this primitive brain thinking instead of thinking carefully about their thoughts and how to calm down and make a positive outcome instead. You know, we can control our anger. We could have little phrases. Um, and this is how we can help our, our young people when they're getting uh, really annoyed with their learning. Maybe we can give them some phrases that they can think through 
Um, it is what it is. I will. It's not worth it. If they're in a fight, it's not about me. Or just to chill out. Okay. Um, it can. They can. They can go into this fight and flight when their learning is not happening as they want it to happen or as they think it should happen. So we can get these negative um, automatic thoughts. So what we're doing using metacognition is thinking about our thinking and then being able to stand back and see the situation in a different way. So we need to be at teaching our young people to be able to stand back and take a moment, become aware of your thoughts and decide whether they're helpful or unhelpful. So you can choose to think in a positive way instead of, instead of letting these gnats or these negative automatic thoughts come in. They come into your mind really, really quickly without you noticing. That's the first thing that comes in. So let's look at an example uh, from the point of view of maybe one of our young people. So imagine you're the young person. You enter your maths lesson late. Maybe you were chatting um, in the corridor. Um, and you, you can't really be bothered to go to your maths lesson. You don't like it, you're dreading it. So your immediate nat thought comes in, oh, this is gonna be long and boring. I hate maths anyway. I don't like the teacher. There's no point in maths. So the teacher gives out the first task and you look at it. And again, your nats come in, your negative thoughts. I can't do maths. I'm gonna struggle with this. So you don't try. Um, the teacher gets upset with you and and that comes in she hates me she can't stand me um, I can't be bothered anyway so you answer the teacher back angrily without thinking I'm not going to do this I can't do it and it leads you to being sent off you know some schools have isolation sent off to the head teacher etc because you've answered back you've allowed one negative thought after another negative thought to come in so let's look at the alternative approach. Okay, you enter your maths lesson early, you greet the teacher. Um, I might as well be cheerful as it might improve my day. The first task you get given is really, really challenging. This is hard, but it might be growing my brain. So you ask the teacher for help, she shows you a new method and she smiles at you. And you think, I like it when she smiles. I'll try again next time. So you can see in the first scenario, we've got one gnat leading to another gnat. And then in the second scenario, we had one positive thought leading to another. And we need to try and use this metacognition to teach our young people to stand back, think about the fight and flight ones, the negative ones, and can they change it round? Um, and create a growth mindset, which we'll look at in a minute, um, and make them emotionally intelligent. Research has shown, and you might have heard about this, you've got IQ and then you've got EQ. People with high IQ do quite well, but then people who've got high EQ, which is emotional intelligence, and that is learning to think about their emotions and learning how to react, they are often the ones that end up very successful in life and really do go places. So it's not all about academics and how high you are academically. If you can control your emotions, it's an absolutely crucial skill to become a leader and an employer, etc. And if we can help our young people with that, then that will help them in the future. So that was our uh, primitive brain let's have a quick look at our emotional brain or it's called the limbic sy system so the, the limbic system is part of the brain that controls your emotions it stores your memories and it sets all your values and beliefs it's very important in learning so the this part of the brain will help you form new memories um, it helps the body learn and remember information now, what's very interesting is the emotional brain loves praise, music, colour, rhyme, uh, and it needs to see the point of learning and remembering stuff. So I'm going to show you later, um, just a little bit later, how we can put in these things that the emotional brain likes into the learning so that learning becomes more successful. 
Okay, so let's look at some of our top tips for being an active learner. So you need to give yourself a reason for learning and remembering, okay? If it's important to you, you're gonna care about it and it's going to count. You've gotta make your learning um, exciting. Um, it helps you remember it. So you can make it colorful, funny, musical. Um, and it's often helpful to talk this through with our children. I mean, you know your young person really well. You know what they enjoy, maybe what type of music they enjoy. Maybe they need to, um, I was always taught you need to turn your music off while you're learning, you can't be doing your two things. But if you're in an enjoyable place and that emotional brain is being stimulated, you can learn better. So it may be that the music that they enjoy will help them learn better. And that is the best way for them to learn. You need to set goals for your learning um, and remembering stuff and reward those efforts. So get your young person to set their goals and maybe even to set their rewards. What do they want to do for having done this piece of learning? What would they like to have? Um, each young person sees rewards in different ways um, and that can motivate them. Um, and then also you need to use your imagination to help you become a better learner and more powerful memory. Now, many famous sportsmen, before they go out and maybe have a tennis match or they have their cricket match or what, whatever sport they're in, they will train in their heads. They will think through what they are going to do, how they are going to approach it. And your young people, as they come up to their GCSEs, that might be something they want to, they might want to spend just a little bit of time thinking about, right, I'm going into this exam. What am I going to do? I'll sit there. Maybe I'll take a minute um, just to relax myself. Maybe not go straight into the paper. I'll uh, open the paper up. I'm going to read question one and question two, and then I'm going to decide what to do. They've gone through the process of the exam in their heads before they've gone in. Um, they've thought it through. So when they go in, there's not this panic and fight and flight straight away. Um, they know what they're going to do and they're going to do. Obviously, things come in and, um, you know, you might suddenly have an interruption in the room and it upsets people. Then again, they have to learn to calm themselves down. So remember, learning is emotional. Um, you can probably still remember your favourite teachers. And this is where when we were thinking about what we're good at and what we're bad at at the beginning, if you put any subjects down that you're good at, I suspect you're good at them and they're the ones that you enjoy because you actually had a really nice teacher for that one who you really clicked with. And that's because that teacher activated your emotional part of the brain and therefore learning took place. So what we're trying to do is learn to activate that bit of our brain so that learning can take place. Okay, the third part of brain, the thinking brain. Okay, the, the posh word for this is the neocortex system. Um, so that's where all the hard work takes place. And again, we can stand back and think about how we're thinking, our metacognition. If we understand how we think, we can improve the way that we approach a task. So when you have a game to play or maybe a piece of furniture to build, IKEA has dropped it off. Now, do you follow the instructions or do you just have a go at figuring out, okay? We each have different strategies. Now it's not one is wrong, one is right, but it's good to think about that strategy and why we do it. And maybe it's not the best strategy because by the time we've put it together and we haven't followed the instructions, we've got to pull it all apart because the bit that we've got sitting in our hand is the bit that should have gone in first. Um, so we've learned maybe it is better to follow instructions. So it's good to, to look at the tasks that you've done and, and good for our young people to look at what they've done, analyze how they've done it, and then think, right, okay, why did that go wrong? Okay, not I was wrong, I was hopeless. Why did it go wrong? What can I do next time to improve it and make learning happen? 
Okay, we're gonna have a little bit of fun here to see whether you're, you are a uh, logical uh, thinker or a creative thinker. So I've got two things. I've got a logical thinker or creative thinker. So what I want you to do, um, some of you will have already printed this out maybe and you can see them. Those that haven't, I'll turn the slide on. I want you to um, just put a yes or no next to each of these or count how many you like out of the logical thinker. I'll give you a couple of minutes just to go through the logical thinker then I'll turn it over to the creative thinker and we'll discover which one you are. Okay, hopefully everybody's done the logical thinking one. Um, so yeses and noes on the logical thinking. Right, here's our creative thinker. Okay, how many yeses and how many noes? Okay, right. Hopefully you've gone through those and you have discovered the one that has the most yeses is the type of thinker that you are, either creative or logical, or you might be fairly even. So I'm going to try and just put a poll up for you. Okay, oops. Right now, this should be should have come up on your screen. Sophie, you can tell me if it's come up on your screen. And I'd like you just to click in. Are you a creative thinker? Are you a logical thinker? Or are you both? Okay, I've got eight of you having answered so far. Now that's, I'll, I'll show you the answers to this. Okay. Oops. Take that one out. Okay, you should, hopefully you can see that. We have no logical thinkers. <laughs> None of us are logical. Maybe a good foster carer is a creative thinker because that's what we have. We have half of you as creative thinkers um, and half of you as both, um, but not, not logical thinkers. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting. It's interesting to do that with your young person um, and see what type of thinker they are. Now, the important thing about this is just because you're one type of thinker naturally and not the other type of thinker, we can become very um, narrow-minded and say, because I'm only a creative thinker, I cannot do anything logically. So we can create, we can get to these habits that hinder our learning. So what we have to do is we, we can find out what type of learner we are, what type of thinker we are, but we need to then become flexible. And for those of you, half of you were both, um, and that's a very good place to be if you're in the middle, because it means you're using both your logical and creative thinking, and that makes you a really, really good learner. So if you think about this, how you can put this into our learning situation, in maths, that's a very logical thing, but maybe 
if you are a creative person, how can you use your creative thinking in your maths? You know, when you're revising something, maybe you make a picture, you draw a picture of what you're revising. So, and the steps that you need to do in your maths become nice little colorful boxes and things. Um, I've, I've taught a lot of children, girls in particular, who like to color all their revision and they have all these color coding and, and they love doing it. And that's the way of getting things into their mind. They are probably quite creative um, they don't have that logical mind, but they're learning to learn logical things through creative thinking. So we want to be overlapping them. Um, again, you know, you can use your logical thinking maybe in your drama or art. If you're not that creative, you can start using your logical thinking in there. So we, we want to be learning to swap across. Right, so here's some uh, top tips for logical thinking. Let me just get this out of the way, sorry. Right, so you need to, if you're a logical thinker, you need to be more open to the idea of trying new activities and ideas because creative uh, thinkers do, but logical thinkers don't. So you don't want to get bogged down in your detail. Practice working well with others. Again, logical thinkers tend to like to think on their own. So you have to try and think outside the box and work with others as well. So you vary your habits and you keep that creative brain working. Um, so it works alongside your logical. Um, I'm actually a very logical thinker. Um, until I learned this sort of stuff, I didn't think I could get my creative brain working. Um, I'm all maths. And so that was the way I worked. Um, but I've learned, I've learned to bring in that creative and improve my thinking through doing that. You've got to know that making mistakes is an important part of your learning. I used to think if I made a mistake, that was awful. I'd gone wrong. OK, we've got an idea that it, we have a wrong. We're not wrong. OK, well, we haven't got it right, but we can learn from it. OK, so our making mistakes is good. And this is what we've got to get across to our young people, that making mistakes is absolutely fine. And it doesn't matter if they make mistakes because we can learn from them. OK, oh, let's go to our creative thinker. So if you are a creative thinker, to be able to use that logical thinking side, you need to try to remember the details, taking one step at a time. You know, you probably you're more impulsive to do things. So you therefore need to take a step back and do things one step at a time. And, and create lists that helps you do that to ensure that you get things done instead of just that impulsiveness. Um, again, it's the sort of planning that you usually miss out as a creative thinker um, and, and prioritize what you need to do. Um, and this is where a, a young person in their learning needs to learn to plan and prioritize their learning in their revision before they even start it. Um, often they'll think, oh, I've got to revise maths, right, okay, or I've got to revise English, I'll open up my book and I'll start. That's no good, that won't get them anywhere. They need time to have the planning and the prioritisation. The creative thinker needs to avoid putting things off because they tend to do that. They need to avoid distraction and distracting others. They don't want to be rushing in without thinking and reading your instructions. So it's, it's sort of slowing yourself down. Creative, you want to get there, do it all, make a beautiful picture, um, but slow yourself down. So there's some top, uh, top tips, if you are one or the other, how to use the other side of your brain. Okay. Right, the other thing that's gonna help our young people um, in their revision is to build in brain boosters. Very, very important. Physical activities give your brain a boost and it will boost your performance when learning. Dancing is a fantastic brain booster. Um, and I've known uh, young people before now, um, I, quite a lot I had year 11 as my form. 
um, and you used to get the girls uh, to get together, do revision, but they would come up with dances for their revisions or songs for their revisions. And they absolutely loved it and things that they couldn't remember or didn't really, weren't really interested in. By the end of doing this for 20, 30 minutes, they had boosted their working memory and they had it stuck. Um, you know, some of them would say, oh, I go into the exam and I want to get up and start dancing. <laughs> so, yeah, there's, there's ways to do it. So encourage them to do that. Um, learning isn't just a very static thing. It's about moving around, um, getting your brain working. You can boost your brain by trying something new every day. You might want to try this. Um, a food you don't want to eat, a TV program that you never watch, person that you don't usually speak to, making those new connections. As you're doing that, what you don't actually realise is your brain is forming new connections. And, you know, we've gone on in life and we, we get this feeling that, OK, we've only formed the connections. My brain has developed. The connections were when I was young. Now I, I can't develop any more connections. You can. Your brain will continue growing. We lose our memory, but you can continue to grow your brain. So you can put in those new, new things. Try something. Get your young person to try things. I know that some of them really resist. But try things. Put, them, put themselves out there. Things that they don't usually do. Like. Building their self-confidence. This is all about doing new things. So do something new that challenges you. OK, make mistakes. That's fine. Get it wrong. You can either put those mistakes right or understand how you you won't go down that mistake again. And there your brain learns, it adapts and it grows. And then in the cycle, you then feel more confident, confident about doing another new thing. So this cycle goes round and round. It's very hard to start the circle going. Um, when you resist doing something new, you can go into your, your little hole and just um, bury yourself away in the things that you know and the things that are common to you. So you've, you've got to really push out to start this circle. But once it starts going, it starts building up. They get a little bit of self-confidence from one thing that they've managed to do that they couldn't do before. And then it builds and it builds and it builds. Um, I'd say I'll go back to my maths classes before now. I've seen young people. I've worked one to one with young people um, and they, they feel they're not very good at something. But as soon as they get one thing that they've tried, you challenge them to do one thing and, and find out where the mistakes are, maybe put it right, but then do it again until they get it right. Suddenly their brain is learning that that's OK. They're adapting, they're growing and they're feeling more confident and they get that confidence. And then they come back the next week and go, I can do that now. Can we go on to such and such? And so it grows and it's like a little snowball effect. And this is what I've been saying about failure and getting things wrong, okay? There's no such thing as failure, only feedback. There's a quote. So what would it mean to you? Think about you, what if you applied it in your life? Where you feel you failed, actually, no, I haven't failed. I've learned something. And then how can we take that failure into success? I've got a quote here from J.K. Rowling, um, you know, who's written all the Harry Potter books, so a very successful author. She wrote, failure gave me an inner security that I have never attained by passing exams. Failure taught me things about myself that I could have learned no other way. I discovered that I had a strong will and more discipline than I suspected. Interesting that somebody who is so successful can talk about failure. Now, earlier I touched on this um, mindset that we have and that we can have a growth mindset or we can have a fixed mindset. So if we think back at that questions I asked you at the beginning, what were you good at? What are you bad at? And many of our young people have formed that, the opinions on these quite early on, like what they're good at and what they're bad at. Now, why? Why? Is it because somebody has told you you're bad at it and therefore you've 
develop this fixed mindset. Um, I developed a fixed mindset for languages when I was at school. Um, I, I think I probably did badly in my first few tests when I went to secondary school. Um, I decided myself I was no good at it. And I just didn't put the effort in because I thought there's, there's no point. I can't learn this. It is impossible. So when we have that fixed mindset, we tend to think um, we, we're born with a fixed amount of intelligence and we can't increase it. Uh, and we have this personality that we can't change um, and nothing can be done. So with that fixed mindset, we stay fixed, but it's the people that can have the growth mindset and they believe that their intelligence can grow and they're the ones that succeed. So the secret is to try and apply your growth mindset to things. One of these days I might go back and see if I can learn the language because um, I really did fix myself that I was going to be hopeless on that. So this is the way people feel with a fixed mindset. You need to um, you might feel you need to get things right straight away. Other people are clever, clever and talented at it and, and you aren't. So it makes you feel good to be able to get things right. And, and you like that with your fixed mindset. But mistakes and failures, they make you feel worried. Uh, and you want to stay in your comfort zone. Um, and this is what I was saying about getting out and building confidence. You like to stay where you know that you're going to get things right. Now, again, teachers don't always help this because some of the phrases they say to our learners um, give them this feeling that they're never going to get it any better. You know, you'll, you'll only do a foundation um, maths question. Uh, you can only do a foundation maths paper. Um, that would be fine. Don't worry. Um, you can get your four. But already you've made that learner feel like they can't go any further. And we have to be very careful as teachers and parents and carers that we don't ever put in this narrative to give the young person idea that they've got a fixed mindset. So if you've got your growth mindset instead, um, you know that it's fine to make mistakes and you know that it's fine to get it wrong at first. So we need to be telling our young people, don't worry, you make mistakes, that's fine. Let's see where it goes wrong. We need, we learn from our getting it wrong. Fear of failure, it's, it's not a problem. So you can take on challenges outside that comfort zone and you might actually enjoy them. Now you love getting feedback, and you use it to improve. That's what you want to do. Your feedback is not someone telling you you are wrong. They're telling you how you can improve. So, you know, it's adjusting those thoughts. Having a growth mindset means you're willing to learn and grow. Um, and you know your mistakes are okay because you're going to learn from them. So we've got to try and get this uh, mindset into our young people and, and then they will fly. So how else can we help our young people um, with their learning? So one belief is that learning is this quick and one-off process. Um, and the fixed mindset builds into this really. Learners often, um, they have a mistake, they can't learn anymore, and they don't improve their performance. So they mistakenly think that they've learned something, they can't do it right now, and therefore they can't ever do it. Learning, in fact, is a very slow process and it benefits from practice and review. So particularly after a delay, and this is called something in the science world, a spacing effect. OK, so a young person might sit down, study something, go, yeah, I've got that. But it's worth getting them to sit down and look at it maybe a week later and just check. Have they really got that or do they need to just look at it again? Yeah, go over it again. So it's, it's a mistake to think that learning is about passive repetition. Let's just repeat things and just let's read through my book. Far more effective to take a topic after a delay that you've, maybe you've looked at it one week, the next week, 
summarize it with flashcards. Um, do something creative to summarize what you learned the week before. And, and you're growing all those connections in your brain. So as parents and carers, we can help learning by encouraging them to recap that learning when they've forgotten something that they could previously do. Again, they, they might think, oh, I've forgotten how to do it. I, I just can't do it. Encourage them that that is normal. That is not because they are no good at it. Um, this idea that because I can't remember it means I'm never going to be able to learn it. That's, that's just a fallacy. So we need to help our young people make a better judgment of what they know and what they do not know. The temptation when they come to their GCSEs is to write out everything that they need to know for their geography and then start learning. Now, if there's a particular topic in their geography that they know and are confident with, they actually don't need to be going over and over that one. They might just have a quick look at it, but they don't. They need to be knowing which topics they are struggling with. Those are the ones they need to spend time on. So they need to see that they're spending different times on different topics. Um, students, they, they often lack the ability to do that. So this is where we can help them. We can talk them through. They can tell you about the different topics and you go, oh, you know a lot about that one. You know a lot about your rivers, um, but you know, maybe your coastal um, geography, that you didn't seem to know quite so much about that. So that might be the one that you start with. Okay, um, so selecting these topics to revise um, is a very important thing and, and working out the time to spend on these topics. So some of the ways, again, we can help them, um, give them time, structure, guidance uh, on what they need to revise, the list of topics maybe that they've got in geography, they could scale them zero to 10 on how well they know them and then start with the ones that were zero and build up. Uh, they might want to be doing little short tests to practice their revision and then doesn't matter if it all went wrong, then they know that that one needs good revision. If it went right, they need to be temp um, not tempted then to revise that topic because it's, it's nice to revise the things you know. It's, it's this comfort zone, isn't it? It's nice to do the things we can, but they've got to get outside that. So make them aware of that dangers of being that inner accurate judgment of what they know help them look carefully at what they know. It's this planning um, and preparation before the revision stage. Very, very important. So here's just a few strategies. We've got five minutes, so I'm gonna quickly go through these. Um, you can use images, um, pictures maybe for revision, group items together, that's always very good. If they've got lists, they can turn them into stories. Mnemonics, a lot of you, you might have learned Richard of York gave battle in vain for the rainbow, uh, the colours of the rainbow. These sort of things that they learn early on, they'll remember. Um, memory palaces or memory journeys, they are quite good. Um, you can learn something by walking from one place to another place. So set up um, the lounge, they might have different uh, flashcards in different places of the lounge and they can walk around learning those pieces. So when they have a topic that comes up in the exam, uh, they think, oh, that was the one that was stuck on the fridge. And again, things then start coming back into their mind. Studying in a favorite place. Don't make them study at their desk if that is an awful place for them studying, you know, curled up on their bed might be a better place. If we study where we enjoy, then again, our emotional part of our brain that I was talking about kicks in and, and we remember. Um, studying collaboratively, that's good as well with friends um, and helping, because again, you remember those study sessions. Some other strategies, uh, using lots of color and images, diagrams and mind maps, carefully structuring how you do your revision, revision cards and posters. And this is something that our tutors are going to be going uh, through with your young people and trying all these different things. Now, they don't all work for this uh, same young person. 
one will prefer another method to another, but our tutors are going to give them these different opportunities to have a go at different methods and think about what's best for them and what is their best thinking and learning practices. And again, what you can do with them is you can discuss each strategy, help them see which one is best for them, um, and make sure that young person has time out um, to really look at these revision strategies and work through them, understand how their brain works, because everybody's work slightly different, and understand how their memory works, and then revise in the best way for them. Um, help them increase that self-awareness, the best time it is to study, maybe the best time blocks, and what are barriers to their revision. Okay, now what I'm going to try and show you, it's a five minute video, so we will be going just over by a few minutes, but then we will be finished, um, about the metacognitive process. And it just really sums up all the things I've been saying. So hopefully you'll be able to, I'll play this and you'll be able to hear it. Right, I've just paused it because I think, it, does it seem like nobody can hear it? Yeah, there's no sound coming through from the video, but there is sound coming through from you. So I'm not sure whether it's just muted. The process of there we go. Okay. One that is used to make decisions that maximize learning outcomes and help students meet their goals. Metacognition is thinking not just about the what of learning, but the how. Ultimately, Metacognition is all about creating the best possible opportunity to learn what you're trying to learn. So when you're learning something, you stop to consider what you're trying to learn, what you know, how you're trying to learn it, how effective your strategies are, and what you can do differently to improve your understanding. Most people don't move beyond cognitive strategies when learning. Cognitive strategies are things tests ask you to do. Recall analyze, interpret, and apply information. Metacognition helps us see which cognitive strategies need to occur so we're best prepared for a test while also showing us what we need to do differently in order to be successful. When we start looking at what we need to do, our learning goal, and how we're going to do it, our plan for learning, we are distinguishing between metacognitive knowledge and metacognitive regulation. There are three basic stages of the metacognition process. Plan, monitor, and evaluate. First, plan your approach to learning a topic, specifically how you will digest the information. Then, monitor your comprehension of the topic as you study with actions such as practice tests. Finally, evaluate the results of your learning when you're finished and modify your approach as needed. These may sound like extra steps, but they are actually essential parts of the learning process. These steps help learners see that they've used their time to recall, analyze, interpret, and apply information. In other words, metacognition helps students know that they really learned something. So what does it look like in action? As a learner, you have to contend with your personal strengths and weaknesses, the nature of the task, and the strategies you have available to you to accomplish the task and overcome any challenges. The process will look different for every student. Let's have a look at Marcus and his ACT study plan. There are two ways he can approach his preparation process. Marcus feels confident with most of the material, although he's a bit iffy on the math and science sections. His plan could involve reviewing an ACT study guide, and a few practice tests leading up to test date. The day will come, he'll live with the grade, and repeat the same process again the next time he takes the exam, perhaps faring better or worse. On the other hand, 
Marcus could take time to consider which ACT sections he already feels confident about, which sections he needs more time to prepare for, as well as exactly how he will monitor his progress during preparation. He could regularly pause to ask, is what I'm doing working? If so, how do I know? After the test, he could evaluate his overall process, if there was anything he could have done differently, and how he will prepare differently next time. It's not hard to see which preparation method best sets Marcus up for success. Let's step back and consider the basic questions you can ask yourself before, during, and after study to attend to the decisions that can make the difference in your performance. Before learning, take time to plan. What am I supposed to learn? What strategies should I use? How much time do I have? While learning, pause to monitor. How am I doing? Am I on track with my plan? Do I understand what I'm learning? Should I adjust my pace? After learning, reflect and evaluate your process. What did I learn? Did I achieve my goals? What could I have done differently? Is there anything I still don't understand? The answers to these questions may not come quickly, but they create an opportunity for you to change how you approach your goals when things just aren't working out the way you want them to. Learning and practicing metacognition means that you'll be your own best indicator for whether you are prepared for a test or not. At the same time, you're helping prepare yourself for more effective learning in the future because you will be able to make the best choices for yourself when your materials and teachers don't deliver what you